the passage, um, that will be really helpful. Um, and if you need a Bible, um, just raise your hand and one of the welcomers will uh, bring a paper Bible to you as well. Let me pray before we begin. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We pray this morning, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will work in us to help us to understand what you have to say to us this morning. Open our hearts and our minds to your voice. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to think closely about church. Uh, Not just church here, but uh, the wider church, the gatherings of believers in all places. Think about what we do in a church. Um, How we dedicate time on Sundays and on the weekdays to listening to the Bible, to prayer, uh, missions, how we sing together, how we call each other brother and sister, how we come together regardless of our race, our background, our age. When you think deeply about these things, you come to realize that church is just something that is just out of this world, so different to the world. But there are times in the church where sometimes you might feel a little bit like the world sometimes. We hear about quarrels, we hear about divisions, arguments, people refusing to speak to each other for days, months, years, decades. You might have experienced some of this yourself. And it feels like worldliness can just creep in to the church sometimes. So how do we address the issue of worldliness in the church? You might hear that some churches call in mediators, consultants. Uh, Some try to tighten up their church strategies and their plans. Some try to get people to serve more, do more ministry. But this morning in the passage that we just read in Corinthians, we hear that the Apostle Paul tackles the issue of worldliness in the Corinthian church by reminding them of the deep roots that they have, the deep roots of unity that they have that make them different to the world and calls them away from worldliness. They are reminded how the church is called to a different wisdom than the world. The church is called to a different spirit than the world. And the church is called to a different attitude to the world. And you can follow along in the outline in your bulletin as well. So how might we address the issue of worldly behavior in the church? Well, if we turn to the passage, we'll see that we have a different wisdom to the world, which is the first point. Look with me at verse 6. Verse 6. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature. I mean, other translations, it says the complete. So the mature, it's referring to all Christians. But not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. You know, there are two wisdoms that you can follow, only two. Uh, God's wisdom or the wisdom of this age. The wisdom of this age has serious limitations. It's only useful for this age which is the time between the creation of Adam to the return of Christ. And that wisdom has a use-by date. The use-by date is, as it says, nothing. It ends in nothing. But God's wisdom is greater. If you look at verse 7, No, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. You know, God's wisdom, it's not limited to this age because it was prepared by God before time began. It's a wisdom that results in our glory. In other words, those who follow God's wisdom can look forward to a time of glory. Quite the opposite to the world wisdom, the wisdom of this age that leads to nothing. So we see that the two wisdoms have a very different timeline, very different result. But what's the focus of these two wisdoms? What's at the heart of these two wisdoms that makes them so different? Look at verse 8. None of the rulers of this age understood it. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. You know, the ultimate difference between the two wisdoms is how they treat the Lord of glory. In other words, those who follow the wisdom of God place the highest value on the Lord of glory, which is Jesus Christ. 
But for those who don't understand the wisdom of God and follow the wisdom of this age, they will completely reject Jesus, the Lord of glory. And it, it makes sense. It really makes sense, doesn't it? If you're only concerned about the here and the now, if you play the game of ignorance of the future that's beyond your life here on this earth, then a time-limited, age-limited wisdom of this age makes complete and perfect sense to follow. But the wisdom of God points to something uh, mind-blowing, unseen, unheard of, unimaginable. Look at verse 9. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. What is this thing that's beyond words that God has prepared? It's the gospel. The gospel, the good news about what God has done for you and for me through the life, the death and the resurrection of Jesus. The gospel, that is the wisdom of God. You know, Paul had explained this wisdom in an earlier chapter. If you can turn just um, a, a page or so, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. And it reads, You are in Christ Jesus who has become wisdom, who's, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, our holiness and redemption. So can you see, the wisdom of God is the good news that through the death of Jesus on the cross and his resurrection from the dead, those who follow him will be, and there's three things there, they will be righteous. That is, they have a right standing with God, no longer under that condemnation of sin. Number two, they will be holy. They are now set apart to be God's people, heading towards glory, not nothingness. And number three, they are redeemed, redeemed, saved for a purpose, on a mission for God, belonging to God, sheltered with God. Let that settle in to you as you hear these words. You and I, we all come into this world with no hope. But through the wisdom of God, we are now transformed to be righteous, holy and redeemed, that should be mind-blowing to you, beyond the best things that you could hear, see, or understand. So how does the wisdom of God, this gospel, address the issue of worldliness in the church? That's our question. Well, can you see that it's just incompatible? Worldliness and the wisdom of God, they just don't, they don't fit together. Because we are a people destined for glory, not nothingness. We are a people of the age to come, not of this age. We are a people of a glorious gospel that's beyond sight, sound, and thought, not just a club. So let's think about how we can apply this. Firstly, as people of the age to come, how concerned are we of the things of this age? Do we invest our time, our effort, our plans, our emotions into things that will pass away? Maybe it's our possessions. Maybe it's our buildings. Maybe it's our legacy. So we, as people of the age to come, are to focus our attention on the wisdom of God, that is the gospel. Secondly, how can we place the wisdom of God, which is the gospel, as a priority in how we make decisions in the church? How can we support and direct most of our resources towards activities that focus on promoting the wisdom of God? How can we make decisions based on gospel principles? And thirdly, how can you and I, how can we personally encourage the person next to you, your brother and sister in Christ, to live a life that reflects that wisdom of God and the glory that you're both, that we're all destined for? Think through what it means for, us to, for you to have a gospel-saturated interaction with somebody. Maybe it's time to not treat that person next to you as uh, simply a friend, but as your gospel partner. So let's prioritize that wisdom of God in our interaction with each other. But this amazing unity that we have centered around the wisdom of God is, 
only possible, only possible because we have a different spirit to the world, which is our second point. Look at verse 10. But God has revealed it to us by his spirit. Okay. How does his spirit enable us to understand the wisdom of God? Well, keep reading. Verse 10 to 12. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given to us. Coming to understand that wisdom and the mystery of God is only possible because the spirit of God reveals it to us. He does it by showing us the mind of God, the mind of God. And that seems like a very abstract concept. What does it see to see? What does it mean to see God's mind? Let me give you an illustration. If, if someone was to come up to you and ask you this question, what is God like? How would you answer that question? What is God like? You know, I've heard both adults and children ask this question. Um, and many who ask this question, um, they actually go on to answer that question themselves with a range of vague uncertainties. You know, I've heard, hey, what's God like? Oh, God, God's like, he's good. He knows the good people, send the bad people to hell. God's everywhere, he's in the sky, he's in my heart. It's very frustrating to hear that. You know why? Because they're just making it up on the spot. Where's the basis of that? But for Christians, we don't need to make up the answer. Because the mind of God has been revealed to us. Because we've been given the mind of Christ. Look at verse 16. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So what is God like? God is like Christ Jesus. We're given a full picture of Jesus in the Bible. What is God doing? Well, just look at Christ Jesus. All that he has accomplished in his life, death and resurrection from the dead. Look at what he has done for mankind. See what he will do when he returns. So to answer that question in a simple way, what is God like? The answer is Jesus. You know, human wisdom tells us to look everywhere else except at Jesus when trying to answer these big questions of life. But we are not people of the spirit of the world that follows human wisdom, but rather the spirit of God. Look at verse 13. This is what we speak, not in words taught by human word, wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. You know, the church is not a place of worldly human wisdom, but of God's wisdom, spoken in words that come from the Spirit of God. Again, see how incompatible human wisdom is with the Spirit of God. They don't fit together because human wisdom doesn't have the power to enable us to understand and accept the gospel. Look at verse 14. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The Spirit of God levels the playing field for every person in the church. Because if you have accepted the things that have come from the Spirit of God, in other words, if, you are someone, if you're someone that can see and understand the gospel, if you call yourself a Christian, if you claim to know Christ, then it's only because the Spirit of God revealed the things of God to you. You and I can claim nothing of our own. It wasn't because you worked it out yourself. It wasn't because you reached a certain level of intellectual ability or your strength to jump from seeing the message of the cross as stupid, foolish, and then seeing it as the power of, of God. You know, the Apostle Paul was once a persecutor of the church. He was on the Damascus road to go and persecute Christians. How ironic. Suddenly struck by God, sees Jesus as Lord, and that's it. It wasn't his intellect or his religious activity, and he had a lot of religious activity. 
it was the Spirit of God, 100%. You and I are only Christians. We can only become a Christian because God's Spirit enables us to understand and accept the gospel. And look at that brother or sister in Christ sitting next to you, in front of you, behind you, beside you. No more or no less. The experience is exactly the same. If every Christian was to come up here and share their testimony in front of the church and explain the reality of how they came to accept Jesus, the answer would be 100% the same. God's spirit revealed God's wisdom to me. They might not say that. Everyone has a different story. But the heart of it is that. And this is why worldly, beha- worldly divisive behavior is just incompatible with the church. Because we've experienced one spirit of God, no more or no less than each other, in order for us to accept and enable um, to, to understand the things of God. No one is more spiritual or less spiritual in the church. And together, together as a church, we have one spirit of God. We can judge everything in life through the lens of the gospel, but no one can judge us in human worldly ways. Look at verse 15. The spiritual man makes judgments about all things, but he himself is not subject to any man's judgment. Christians simply live life with a different lens. It's the lens of the gospel. You know, that's why you can meet another Christian who you've never met before, and you feel, you feel that deep, deep unity. You know, have you ever experienced that closeness and unity with other Christians? Because you actually know what's going on in their head. You actually do. You know what's going on in their head and in their heart and in their mind because you have the same spirit in operation in both of you. We experience this all the time. You know, for example, when you're having a, 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 a gathering mixed with Christians and non-Christians and a non-Christian friend says something, you can tell that all the other Christians are thinking the same thing in their heart and in their mind. They're thinking, we love you, friend. You need the gospel, man. They're thinking the same thing. At the same time, you and your non-Christian people might have a whole range of other things going on that you disagree with. The sausages weren't cooked properly. The people here are boring. The music's too loud. This place is ridiculous. I'm tired. I want to go home. But there's that deeper level of unity that you have, and that's the operation of the spirit within both of you, all of you. Another example is if you're serving with other Christians and you go into a place that just seems hostile to the gospel, suddenly all of the differences that you have, the issues that you have with your fellow brother and sister in Christ just melts away, just melts away as you become united as ambassadors for Christ in the world. You know, if you want to feel this, just you can do it straight after the service. Get another Christian, walk down King Street and start door knocking and tell uh, together. Or you can come to a lunch in the park where we seek to speak to those who don't know Christ. And as you do more of these things, the more the world will see us and judge us as weird, time wasters, dodgy, cultish, a whole range of other things. But remember, look at verse 15. We are not subject to any man's judgment. So the Spirit of God unites the church as a people of God, and it unites the church on its mission. You know, when we seek to reach those who are unsaved and lost, what emphasis do we place on the work of the Holy Spirit? Might it be the case that we place too much emphasis on our methods and our engagement, our efforts? If God's Spirit is the only one that can open a person's eyes to the gospel, we should be prioritizing prayer praying for this to happen in the lives of those who we are trying to reach, all of our outreach efforts would yield nothing, nothing without the Spirit of God. Take this time this week to pray for your friends, your family who don't know Christ, and specifically pray this prayer. Pray the prayer that God's Spirit will open their hearts and their eyes, their minds to accept the things of God and the wisdom of God, because the Spirit is the key. So since we have a different wisdom to the world and a different spirit to the world, we are therefore called to have a different attitude to the world, which is our third point. 
You know, in year eight and year nine, I went to a school and uh, you would call the school a fundamentalist, conservative Christian school. Um, this school that I went to was obsessed with being separate from the world. You know, I remember uh, a school camp. I had to go home because they said that the clothes I had, the particular brand, was worldly. I remember after the Easter show, um, I had <clears throat> the Simpsons show bag. <clears throat> and it came with a Simpsons um, pencil case. Several other kids in the class also got the Simpsons show bag. It was on special. <laughs> we got paraded and got told to throw our Simpsons pencil cases in the bin. Why? Because the Simpsons are worldly. And there was an endless list of things about things that were worldly that you can't bring into this school. But look at the definition of worldliness according to Paul in the passage you'll see that it's not an item, but rather an attitude or behavior. Look with me at verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 3. Chapter 3, verse 3. You are still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like me, men? Attitudes of jealousy, quarreling, factions, these behaviors and attitudes are worldly. Just turn on your TV. You'll see these behaviors depicted on your popular TV show, series, movie. You'll see it on the news. Go to your workplace. Sit in your local PNC. Your club. This is almost how people operate by default. And these worldly behaviors and attitudes result in people creating divisions and drawing lines between people in the church. Look at chapter 3, verse 4. For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not me, men? You know, the issue here is that worldliness has caused some in the Corinthian church to create divisions where no divisions actually exist. They were drawing lines between themselves where no lines should exist. It's almost like they forgot those deep roots of unity in their shared understanding of the wisdom of God and in that shared experience of the Spirit of God. And although they have all that they need to be spiritual people, God, uh, Paul can't describe them in that way. Look at verses 1 and 2 of chapter 3. Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly. <clears throat> Mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You know, what Paul is saying is, that although their status might be of uh, being brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, they are also still in Christ. Cool. They are exhibiting attitudes that are best described as being worldly infants in Christ. Paul is saying, you're not acting your spiritual age. You know, they seem to be in God's family because they understand and accept the wisdom of God and the spirit of God, which is the milk that can go down their throats okay, it's going down. But they can't take solid food because their throats are just so restricted, swollen with pride, worldliness. This is describing people in the church that seem to have some measure of faith. They truly see the wisdom of God, Christ and his gospel. But they really haven't made any progress beyond that because they're too preoccupied with worldly things, worldly attitudes like jealousy, Quarreling, factions. Paul's basic accusation here against the Corinthians and worldly Christians, if you want to call it that, is that in acting in a divisive way, they behave as if they belong to this age and as if they don't have the spirit. In other words, they live as if they were no different to the rest of Corinth. So this morning, I want us to think through various worldly attitudes that you and I might have towards others in the church? Have you drawn any uh, imaginary lines between yourself and others in the church? Are you spending, or am I spending, disproportionate times in quarrels and jealousy instead of the ultimate things that unite us? Just think about those two activities I, taught, I, I talked about before, being on mission together feeling and sharing the spirit of God as the one who unites us. 
you know, we, we all struggle with these worldly attitudes. But as we struggle, let's keep coming back to those deep roots of our unity. Because we have the wisdom of God revealed to us and the spirit of God dwelling in us. So how do we address the issue of worldly behavior in the church? Well, this passage today gives us a warning, an appeal, a hope, and an encouragement. Firstly, there is a warning to those in the church who continue to have persistent worldly quarreling, jealousy, factions, and attitudes. It's a serious matter. It's a serious matter because you might need to consider if your worldliness is an indication that you are no different to the person that does not have the Spirit of God. And this is certainly something that Paul wanted his readers to consider. That's why he asks that question twice. Are you not mere men? Are you not acting like mere men without the Spirit? Secondly, there's an appeal. There's an appeal to, to those who just don't know the wisdom of God or have the Spirit of God. Maybe, maybe you're just trying to understand what is this big deal about Jesus? Like, what's the big deal? Why do all these people keep talking about Jesus? And why does everything... I know this person, and every time he just lands on Jesus. We go to a barbecue, lands on Jesus. I'm in the car with him, he just lands on Jesus. Why does everything keep landing on Jesus? I, I don't know why. I can't see it. Well, it starts with asking, praying to the Lord for his spirit to help you see his wisdom. You know, you can pray. Lord, open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to know Jesus. And know that that prayer is the prayer <coughs> that your friends, your Christian friends, have for you because they want you to, to not end life with nothing but instead be in glory together in the age to come. Thirdly, there's hope. There's hope for the struggling worldly people in church, the infants in Christ. If this is you, if you struggle with this, if you truly possess the Spirit of God, then let those deep roots of our unity in the gospel and the spirit of God enable your pride and your worldly attitudes to take a back seat. Since you have the spirit of God in you that enables you to accept the word of God, how about next time when we have a scripture reading? When the reader says, this is the word of the Lord, rather than automatically saying and responding with thanks be to God, say those words with true thankfulness that God has given you his spirit to enable you to accept these as the very words of God and then apply it apply the word remember that those without the spirit they're not really thanking God when they hear the word of God nor can they apply it you can you can and finally there's an encouragement to us as a church to keep the gospel as the center of all that we do. Placing the highest value on the gospel of Jesus will safeguard against worldliness creeping in. You know, I'm, I'm actually I'm so thankful um, of this church. When I see the staff team, when I see leaders, congregation members, both old and young, people that have been in this congregation for a short time or for all their life, when I see us working hard in making the gospel the center of what we do, it's such a joy. It speaks of the spirit and it speaks of the age that we're living for. Let's never move away from this. And on a personal note, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for blessing me and my family over the past three years. Um, because the gospel focus that we've seen has produced much fruit in the life of my family and I'm sure it has in, in, in yours and in your own life. So let us keep each other accountable to living our lives in step with the wisdom of God. And as a people of the Spirit of God, let's walk together on our journey towards the glory of God, the glory that God has destined for us in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit who enables us to see the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, you alone have allowed us by your grace to be part of your family and share in the glory of the age to come. 
We pray that you will help us live lives worthy of the gospel. Rid us of worldliness so that we may receive the solid food of your word. We pray for the various things that you have prompted in our hearts this morning. And we ask that your spirit enable us to apply this word in our lives. And we pray this in the name of Christ. The Lord.